Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone who may be watching this as a recording later on. Today, we're going to be making kima or kima matar or martar kima. And this dish actually has a really interesting history. Um, it, it's a medieval Indian dish, in fact, and it was very popular in the Mughal court. And apparently was used in the Mughal court, it featured on a weekly basis, but in some sort of some of the lower echelons below the below the Mughal court itself, it was part of like the weekly rotation amongst the arist aristocracy. And then amongst the even lower castes beneath that, it was sort of only used for special feasts and, and ceremonies. So a very specialty item. Um, you can tell that it has changed though as a recipe because this recipe features tomato paste, which of course came to India after the pre-Columbian exchange, although it's hard to imagine Indian cuisine without tomatoes in some capacity. But so this dish in essence is kima means ground meat. And that word actually comes from Turkic. It was brought, brought to the uh, Indus Valley by the, the Mongols, basically the Mughals who took over in the 17th century, 16th century, 16th century. And so kima means ground meat. And it's exactly the same word basically as in Turkey, kima, which is why you have kima pita, for instance, in Turkey, the ground meat, exact same word. So kima is the ground meat and then Matar is the peas. So it is a ground meat and pea curry. And it is one of my favorite curries. And I've had really tasty versions and I've had really awful flavorless versions. So today we're going to make a tasty version. Now for the ground meat, you can use beef. You can use, we're using lamb. And if you can get it, you can use ground goat. It's basically a red meat curry. And, you know, probably if people in the Indus Valley had had them, they would have used ostrich too, because ostrich is tasty as hell. And it is red meat. It is, it is not the other white meat. So what kind of cut of lamb would you use? Uh, what cut? So, I mean, um, ground, ground lamb is usually made from like lamb shoulder. Um, but I, I use, if, if I can get it, I actually like ground, la uh, ground leg because it's, it has a lot of fat, lamb, leg of lamb. But the typical cut that gets used in a lot of, um, a lot of lamb dishes where it's not like lamb cutlet is, is sh sh lamb shoulder. But I personally do really like lamb leg, um, lamb shank. I would never grind up a lamb shank. That lamb shank should just be braised until it falls off the bone. But yeah, if you, it's it's hard to get lamb shoulder. It's harder to get lamb shoulder in stores. It's much easier to get leg of lamb in stores. So generally, I end up grinding. If I'm going to grind my own, I grind leg of lamb. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> Okay, so let's go ahead and do our ingredient tour. So of course, first we have our, I didn't actually get it out. Yeah. First we have our ground lamb. Um, and I'm lucky because even though I'm in Korea, there's a large community of immigrants from Muslim countries here. And so we have halal meat, which means ground lamb, so yay. <clears throat> And actually rather large quantities. Let me go ahead and do the recipe. And then we have our primary fat. We have ghee. So of course, ghee is clarified butter, for those who don't know. It means you heat it up and then you separate out the white bits that separate out of the yellow bits. The white bits are the proteins and the milk solids. And those are what will burn if butter gets too hot. What with ghee, if you remove those milk solids, it basically becomes butter oil and it has a much higher smoking point. Also, if you have issues with lactose and or casein, ghee will not cause you any problems because all of that has been removed. So it's actually a very, and especially if it's grass fed and it has all that vitamin A and vitamin K from being grass fed, ghee is very good for you. It's a really good saturated acid profile, saturated fatty acid profile. Next, we have our cumin seeds. So, Cumin seeds, of course, you know, you can get it ground, you can do it as seeds. In this recipe, we're using it for seeds, and we'll talk about why that is when we get to the cumin. We have our cloves, whole cloves. And for those who don't know, oh my God, whoever closed this really closed it hard. I think that was me, actually. For those who don't know, um, cloves are a natural analgesic. So if you eat enough of these, your mouth will go numb. And clove oil can actually be used as a natural topical analgesic and was used as a natural topical analgesic in medieval Europe, possibly also in medieval India. I'm not as certain about that one, but um, India was a highly advanced civilization, especially when it came to medical matters. So I'm confident they figured out that clove oil 
<laughs> was an analgesic. We have our Ceylon cinnamon sticks. And I know some of you have heard this before, but for those who haven't, um, Ceylon cinnamon is distinguishable from cassia cinnamon by the fact that it has this mealfoy appearance. The important thing to note is that Ceylon cinnamon is true cinnamon, Ceremonum verum, and is the only one that has all of those health benefits that you always hear about in various medical journals. Cassia, the hard single shell of the cassia tree, cassia cinnamon does not, and actually is not good for you in large quantities. Then we have our Tejpata, and this is Indian bay leaf. Now, if you don't know, Indian bay leaf is not Mediterranean bay leaf. It's a completely different leaf. I can show you. I mean, they're, I, I'm actually not certain whether they're related at all, <laughs> but this is your Tejpata, Indian bay leaf. This is your laurel, your Mediterranean bay leaf. And you can see they actually don't really look anything alike. The veining on the one leaf is completely different from the other. The laurel leaf has more of a, a savory smell to it, whereas the bay leaf, the Indian bay leaf, the Tejpata, has sort of cinnamon and clove. It's almost like an allspice leaf. So if that's a big difference and will make a big difference in your cooking. If you can get Indian bay leaves, I recommend it. It's possible if you have, you know, a big Asian grocery store, you can also order them online. <clears throat> then we have black cardamom. Now black cardamom have a really deep smoky flavor and are definitely not the same as green cardamom. So you can't just substitute one for the other at all. Flavor profiles are completely different. Now, this is also used in certain garam masala mixtures, like my garam masala has black, uh, black cardamom in it, which is not common in the commercial ones. And so it is the seed pod of a, a species of cardamom tree. And um, yeah, it has a really nice smoky smell. So that will be a big flavor giver in today's dish. So those are the spices. Oh, and then of course we have garam masala, which is a spice blend. You can, this is unfortunately a commercial one. I ran out of my homemade last night and haven't had a chance to make more. Um, it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super fond of the commercial ones because they tend to just be a lot of black pepper and a lot of cinnamon and not the right kind of cinnamon because they use the cheap one, which is the cassia. But it's what's gonna have to do this morning. I didn't feel like toasting and grinding my own, my own garam masala for this morning. Okay, um, now let's talk about our aromatics. There's quite a few aromatics in this curry. And for those who maybe haven't made a curry before, you know, curry has various layers and you add different flavor givers at different points. And very commonly for many curries, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to saute onions. And before you saute your onions, you're going to heat up your butter in your pan and put some seeds in it to get the flavors out. But our aromatics in this are red onion. If you only have yellow or white onion, that's, that will be fine. But red onions are more mild and sweeter. So that's the big difference. We have garlic, of course. We'll be doing a lot of that. Thankfully, in Korea, where I am, we can get garlic pre here. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen red onions, but I've only known them to be very spicy. Uh, well, you know, it also depends on, I guess, where they grow. But, but for me, sweet onions are always more mild than, than yellow onions. Not more mild than, I mean, a Vidalia onion is really super sweet, obviously. But in, in my experience, red onions are, are, and they cook up more sweeter than yellow onions do. But, you know, I like, I, I wouldn't, I don't like white or yellow or, unless it's Vidalia onion, but white or yellow onion in a salad, uh-uh. Red onion in a salad, yes. So to me, the red onion is a more mild onion. But again, you know, the soil in which a plant grows will kind of cause, cause a big divergence there. Okay, um, so of course, saying we have garlic, big primary aromatic in Indian cuisine, and ginger root. Now you'll notice that this ginger root is rather small, and that's because it's not a monstrously uh, nourished or overnourished version from China. This is actually what ginger should look like. It should not be massive. And uh, this is from Korea. So this is grown locally to me at any rate. Um, at the very end, we'll be adding fenugreek leaf. And fenugreek is sort of the parsley of the 
of Indian cuisine and actually other cuisines as well, Persian cuisine. Um, and it's got a really rich smell. I love, I love the smell of fenugreek. And it can be fresh or dried. If you can get fresh, by God, use it. But I would use the fresh as a garnish at the end. For me, you know, if I could get fresh, I'd probably use it earlier in the recipe maybe. But fenugreek is a very important flavor giver. It's a very round, rich smell. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned, this post-Columbian version of matarquima has, contains tomato paste. And tomato paste is not gonna make this taste like tomato. This is just umami. Tomatoes are rich in umami and savory flavor. So this is a flavor enhancer. That's why tomatoes are in so much food today. So many dishes across the world is because they really do enhance the flavor. Okay, then those are all our aromatics. And of course we have our primary ingredients. We have potato. And actually I have a Korean sweet potato, which are much, 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 much less sweet and much more firm than uh, American sweet potatoes. So I'm considering possibly including one of those too. But for now, we've got our potato, which of course, this is also a sign that this dish has been modified post-Columbian exchange because potatoes are also a new world vegetable and didn't really make their appearance in cuisine until the 17th and 18th century. <clears throat> and then of course we have peas and I'm lucky that I actually have fresh peas. So I actually, I spent, my, my sons and I spent last night doing a whole lot of pea shelling. So we're gonna, this is, this will be, the recipe calls for fresh or frozen. And when we get to that point, I will indicate the difference because you cook, you use the fresh ones differently than the frozen ones. Because the frozen ones are basically already cooked, whereas the fresh ones are not. Should I take my frozen peas out of the fridge because they're to thaw or do they want to stay frozen? No, just you can leave them frozen because they, they take so little frozen peas. That's a good question. Frozen peas take so little time to, uh, to come to thaw and to cook that you can just put them frozen into the dish. Okay. Yep, good question. No point in letting them thaw. Uh, because you know what you don't want to have happen is for your peas to overcook and peas that have been frozen, they overcook. <laughs> very quickly because the freezing process breaks down a lot of cell walls, et cetera, et cetera, whereas uh, fresh peas don't. So we'll be putting these in, the fresh peas in, in an earlier stage than we will put frozen in. Okay. Good question. Thank you, Dana. Okay, I believe I'm just taking cast a gander here. Okay, those are all of our ingredients. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on the preparation together. And I'm just gonna go ahead and switch the camera. So that we can have a different angle. You can see my prep process. So uh, F, okay. We cutting our onions first. Okay, so yeah, the very first thing we're going to do, as always, is cut our onions because we want to get that chemical reaction going that actually causes micronutrients to build in your onion, making your onions healthier. So we're going to be we're going to be mincing these pretty finely. Um, it doesn't it doesn't need to be super minced, but we really don't want them to make much of an appearance <laughs> in our dish. Yeah, so we are going to be preparing these in a finely chopped fashion. So for those who don't know, if you're watching this and you're not, you don't know the best way to cut your onions. I actually started on that one. So only cut off the stem end first, leave the root end on, then cut it in half like that so that the root end will actually hold your onion together. And then you can peel it very easily. Then you peel it. And I like to do all my onions, do, do this process to all the onions at once and then just chop everything at once. So we cut all of our onions in half, I'm cutting off the root. Ooh, and this onion has some not good parts. So just peel that off. And these onions are actually on the, a little on the small side, so I will be getting another one to add to the mix. 
because the onions add, you know, they, they're, they're the sweet giver, as it were. <clears throat> now, if you're, for those of you who might be allergic to lilies, members of the lily family, onions, garlic, etc., you can still make this dish. You just obviously leave out the onions and for the flavor components of the garlic and onion, you can use uh, asafoetida. Onions are part of the lily family? Yeah, yeah, Oni onions and garlic are all lilies. I have, I have onions growing in the backyard and their flowers look like large dandelion puffs. I know, they're li li so being, being part of the lily family doesn't make it a lily blossom. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a taxonomy thing. So like how strawberries aren't technically berries? Exactly. It's about, it's about, the, it's about the bulbs and the growing, how they, uh, how they grow, how they pro proliferate, yeah. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that are part of the lily family that um, you would never guess are. Like I didn't, I didn't really know that until I had a friend who, um, <laughs> You know, she she pretty much starts internally bleeding if she eats anything from the lily family and lilies. And I, I thought, well, okay, that's pretty easy, right? Just don't go into your garden and munch on your flowers. Well, no, that's not so easy. So okay. Are, are mm -hmm. there any who cooks with lily bulbs or tulips? Uh, oh, yeah. So actually, I'm not certain if tulips are part of the lily family. That's a good question. I kind of assume they would be, in fact. No, no, no. Are there people who cut or who will eat them? Oh, <laughs> funny story about that. Um, no, uh, tulip. No, tulips will make you very, very sick if you eat okay. the bulbs. Um, so funny story about that. There's actually, have you heard of tulip mania? I haven't. Okay. Actually, let me get the let me get the onion started, and then I'll tell you about tulip mania and bulb tulip bulb eating. Okay. So for our onions, we're going to cut them horizontally this way and you want to make sure that you cut carefully so that you don't slice the tips of your fingers off <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me I am so sorry I woke up very phlegmy this morning ah, still recovering from bronchitis so we cut them horizontally this way and then we're going to cut them thinly in vertical lines this way making certain not to penetrate that root but getting pretty close to the root and then we cut perpendicularly going down, keeping our fingers in a nice claw, nice fine chop here. And then when I get to the end, I actually like to cut off these bits as well so that we minimize the amount of waste. So that is how we chop onions for this. And if you see any bits that are, you know, still a little bit big, just give them a chop. So this is the kind of chop for which we're looking for this recipe. So it's not really minced, it's just a fine chop. So tulip mania. So tulips actually come from Persia originally, and they've migrated their beautiful flowers, obviously. And they've, you know, they're the Muslim world being a lover of beauty and fine art. Uh, tulips made their way from Persia to the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottomans brought them, of course, with them when they went to Constantinople <clears throat> and conquered it. And eventually through trade, the D Dutch traders got a hold of some of these beautiful flowers and brought them back to the Netherlands. And tulip mania started because suddenly everyone wanted tulips because they were a rare exotic flower at that time and they were expensive. And so, um, you know, they started, it, it started becoming a way that, you know, tight fisted prudish Huguenots or Protestants, Calvinists, excuse me, could actually express some kind of level of vanity and conspicuous consumption by purchasing and displaying and gardening these beautiful flowers. And there were certain very rare breeds that were worth tens of thousands of dollars per bulb if you could get them, they were so rare. So there's this urban legend that one, one, uh, one you know, sort of um, worksman, that's not the word, I'm a craftsman, um, was working at his master's estate and uh, he got hungry and, and mistook a $10,000, something worth 
equivalent modernly $10,000 mistook a $10,000 tulip bulb for an onion and ate it. And so he literally, the legend goes that he literally ate, oops, I got that one wrong. He literally ate $10,000 worth of tulip bulb. Now we know this is an urban legend because he couldn't have really gotten past the first bite without realizing it was not an onion. And also he would probably have started feeling pretty sick about halfway through the bulb because the, the chemicals in a tulip bulb are designed to prevent animals from eating them so that you know they can continue proliferating. And that's true for humans as well. So they would have, he would have started suffering some pretty serious gastrointestinal distress. Wouldn't have killed him. It would have made him wish it had. No. Yeah. So no, there are no dishes for tulip bulbs. <laughs> and I mean, onions used to have and, and sort of kind of have defenses as well, but we've, we, you know, being humans, we always just fight, we push past it. <laughs> so what we've always done historically with foodstuffs, we figured out a way to make it edible, to push past the plant's natural defenses. Do anything about making us cry though. I'm I'm sorry. What? Still make us cry though. Oh yeah, exactly. Well, you know, we'll push through the pain. Onions, peppers. I mean, even garlic raw is. You know, it 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 hurts. So yeah, that's my uh. That's that's tulip mania. It was there's this there's this urban legend about tulip mania in so it happened in the 17th century, and it's you know there's this economic theory that it's the first economic bubble in 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 human history in essence, because they started trading on the margin, they started short selling, they started selling futures all relating to tulip bulbs, and and the. The, the value skyrocketed. Of course, it's always a question of, of scarcity. And as more and more people grew tulips and as they spread and they get more and more bulbs, then all these people who bought all these futures contracts on tulips, when the future came and the, the market, the bottom of the market fell out because there was, there was just too much supply, um, then, you know, <laughs> All those future contracts were pretty worthless, but there's, you know, there's an urban legend or there's some theories of history or circles of history that claim that so many people ended up losing their livelihoods and there were mass cases of bankruptcy over tulips. And I, I recently uh, read a paper debunking that that examined court cases from this era. And there was only one bankruptcy, one that was vaguely related to tulips, but it wasn't directly related to tulips. And it certainly wasn't related to you know, having put their entire fortune in tulips and then lost it. So I always thought like considered tulips to be pretty considered similar to roses. Did Europe do not have roses at the time? Oh yeah, no roses. Oh, roses have been in Europe for th thousands of years. No tulips and roses are not even vaguely related. No, no, I know that, but they just like, I always grew them in the same family because they had a sort of similar flower. Thing. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, they're, 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 they're not. <laughs> And, uh, you know, roses are, have been in Europe for a very, very long time. As, as, at first, of course, as wild roses, and then like everything that humans find tasty or attractive, they started, you know, selectively breeding them to the monstrous versions that we have today that look pretty, but don't smell like anything. Oh, all right. I think these red onions are harder than my eyes than normal onions. I have to get some goggles real quick. <laughs> okay. Okay, so for those who are watching, once we uh, finish your onions, and this is basically how they should look, so hand for scale. We're just going to go ahead and scrape this into a bowl. And remember, dear viewer, never use the blade of your knife for uh, scraping your bench. Use the back of your knife, that's no problem. But if you use the blade of your knife, you will cause it to dull in faster than had you not done that. And for those who might not have heard my brief, my, my TED talk on cutting boards before, the best kind of cutting board you can have is a wooden one for many reasons, one of which is that 
wood is digestible. So any little wood bits that end up in your food from, you know, little micro microscopic wood bits that end up in your food from cutting on it will be digested and fine. Whereas plastic micro bits are possibly carcinogenic and or autoimmune inflammatory. And also um, plastic will dull your blade very quickly. And so will glass. Glass cutting boards will also cause your blade to dull very, very quickly. Okay, so now we're on to our uh, garlic. And for our garlic, so we'll go ahead and pause here. <clears throat> Okay, so for those who are, I actually thought I would mention, so if you're working from a bulb and you've never done this before, so you peel, peel the papery bits off. Oh, and mine started sprouting a little bit, and that's fine. Even though it started sprouting, in fact, I would keep this little green bit and chop it up and toss it in with the onions because that's good garlic flavor. So to work with a fresh clove like this still attached to the bulb, one of the techniques, a good technique, and this is how they do it in Spain, <laughs> a very garlic heavy country, to get that peel off is to put it under your knife like this, the flat of your knife, like this, and punch it. And that actually breaks, well, on it. yeah, there it goes. That actually cracks the peel off really easily, like so. So if you're going to, if you're working from unpeeled garlic, that's how to get it peeled easily. Another technique, if you have boiling water, is to parboil it quickly, very, very quickly in the boiling water, dump it in, then fish it out, because the hot water will, in fact, actually separate the skin from the clove and make it very easy to peel as well. A good trick I have for garlic, if you want to I cut off the wood, and then I put it in a, put a bunch in a glass jar and shake it up for 30 seconds. I think it's really easy to get the peel off afterwards. You, you cut off the end and do what? I put it in a glass jar and shake it for three seconds. Oh, 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 right, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I have heard of that technique too, although I, I find it faster just to do the, the pound method. <laughs> well, yeah, but like you're making a paella and you want the old clove. Ah, oh yeah, for paella I tend to use the, uh, if, or if I'm, yeah, if I'm working in large quantities of garlic, I tend to use the parboil method. Okay, so preparing our garlic. For this recipe, you can use a garlic press if you want, but the recipe, this is actually an Indian Indian recipe, and it actually calls for a mortar and pestle, and my pestle is missing. Uh -huh. Okay, that's interesting. My pestle has wandered off. So we're actually, maybe if I can find my granite pestle, uh, we can actually use a mortar and pestle to grind the garlic into a paste. And it actually sometimes is easier and faster than using a garlic press, depending on your garlic press. And then you don't have to worry about fishing out the little bits. From, oh, there it is. You don't have to worry about fishing out the bits from your garlic press. So if you're, and it's interesting because you want to add, if you're going to use a mortar and pestle to grind certain things like garlic or ginger, um, you actually add a little bit of water. And this allows it to be easier to grind because the water kind of gives it a little bit more to work with. But it also keeps the temperature of the grinding a little bit lower so you don't end up releasing uh, contents you don't want to through the, uh, through the heat of friction. So we're just going to put a drop or two of water in here. And we're going to go ahead and so one one iteration of this recipe is five cloves of garlic. I'm making a double batch. So we will be doing quite a bit of garlic. I put the garlic on the table. So I'm actually going to do mine in batches because I don't have a giant mortar and pestle. Um, you know, cultures that use mortar and pestles pretty heavily in their cooking, they tend to have very large ones. And I do have a large one, but not with me. So first I just pound it to kind of get the process started. Like so. Okay. 
You know, a lot of people think a mortar and pestle is just, you know, a grinding thing, but you really, in many cases, you start by pounding whatever it is you're grinding to get it broken down, and then we go to the grinding action. You know, mortar and pestle is the, is the pre-industrial food processor. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty good. So then we grind by taking the tip of your pestle and dragging the contents against the sides. And then you can get the whole grinding action going. And uh, onions, or excuse me, garlic, are very similar to onions in the sense of you want to get that sort of done as early on in your prep preparation process because this will allow those chemical reactions I mentioned that will actually form more micronutrients. I'm now going to scrape this down a little bit because there's some chunks that are adhering to my pestle. All right, but you can see we're, we've got a pretty nice paste going here. I'm just going to try to eliminate those last, those last chunks. And uh, I know a lot of, many of my Indian friends keep a jar of, um, of garlic paste in their fridge and also of ginger paste and some of them keep a pre-blended jar of pre-mixed jar of ginger and garlic paste and I actually keep saying I'm going to do this because I do cook curry like every week and I never get around to it but because for many recipes the ratio of ginger to garlic is kind of the same for many curries you know, the amount the same almost a standard sort of thing in certain regions of India. And remember that, you know, India is a massive country. It is not a cultural monolith. It is not a linguistic monolith and is most assuredly not a culinary monolith. So, you know, kima, kima matar will be prepared in a slightly different fashion depending on where you are in India. And being from the Mughal court, this is in its origin a northern Indian dish. Okay, so here is what we're looking for if we're grinding it. Oof, that is amazingly more pungent than if I'd used a garlic press. So I'm just going to go ahead and scrape this out and put it in a separate ingredients bowl. And remember, dear viewer, that you always want to prepare all of your ingredients first or many of your ingredients first before you actually start cooking. So of course, the usual process here is that we're going to um, saute our garlic or onions for a while, and then we will, sorry, then we will add uh, our garlic and our ginger, and this is a very typical process in many curries. So first you sort of get the onions almost close to caramelizing. And then you add your garlic and ginger. We'll fry that until it's fragrant. So I want to just make sure, like I said, we want to get that garlic going now so that um, the, the chemical reaction has a chance to happen and we can get maximum micronutrients out of our food. Next batch. Ooh, I drank my water. <laughs> I drank the water I'd intended to pour into the mortar. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and grind, grind, grind. <clears throat> yeah, I'm always fascinated to consider how different so much of our cuisines, so many of our cuisines would be if we hadn't, if, if Columbus hadn't decided to go and try to find Japan <laughs> the wrong way. <laughs> um, because, you know, or tomatoes really have completely transformed so many dishes. Most people can't imagine lasagna without tomatoes, but, you know, lasagna before tomatoes was a very, very different dish. So, Rachel? Yes. Why do you mint the garlic before putting it? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Why didn't you mince the garlic first before putting in the pesto? Uh, because there's no reason for that. That's, that's extra work. The pestle will handle it really quickly. I mean, this took me 30 seconds. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah there's, there's no reason for that. And honestly, I think, I'm not certain, I actually think mincing it might, um, might, might make it harder to break down. Um, just because then you've got all these little squares instead of big pieces that will break down easily under under the pestle. But yeah, it's already it's it's a paste. See, nice and pasty. So I found this podcast on BBC called You're Dead to Me, <laughs> which is it's a it's a funny history podcast, so they have a his, they have a host, a BBC host, and then they have a historian who on an expert on a specific subject, and then they have a comedian, like a world famous comedian who who uh, is there to kind of learn something, but also to crack wise jokes about the things that the historian is is saying. And um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's pretty darn funny, and this was relevant to me grinding. Oh, yeah, they were talking about, oh, there was one on medieval Christmas. And, uh, yeah, they were, they were talking about, the, the historian was talking about the food, and she wasn't actually entirely wrong. I'm used to historians who aren't food historians, you know, passing on a whole bunch of lies about medieval cuisine. But she actually, she actually was pretty accurate. But she actually mentioned medieval lasagna, which is where this connects to pre-tomato world. Which, you know, for those of you who don't know, medieval lasagna it still has layers of pasta, the, the foil of, the, they call it in the original recipes, the foils of pasta, you know, thin layers. But, and it has cheese, but no tomato sauce. And instead, um, you know, the, the primary flavor giver is cinnamon, actually, in the dish. So it's basically layers of pasta and cheese and cinnamon and a little bit of sugar. And that was lasagna. It's very good, actually. Okay, I declare my garlic pasted. <clears throat> right. So our ginger. Now, for those who don't know, Honestly, the best way I feel to peel ginger is to use the edge of your spoon because then you get just the peel off and you don't end up wasting lots of it to the peeler because, of course, a vegetable peeler is designed to take much thicker skin off. For example, the skin of a very dirty potato or the skin of a 
There's a lot of things that I, a skin of a, an apple, for instance, has a pretty thick peel. Although, for most apples, you really should just eat the peel. The peel is where a lot of the micronutrients are in fruits like apples. And in fact, in citrus fruits as well, you should eat the peel, because the peel is where nearly all of anything worth eating is in citrus fruits, from a micronutrient perspective. I read that oranges are green, depending on because the peel has chloroformin, chlorophyll. No, chlorophyll. It does and have it, chlorophyll, yes. Um, and in, in that case, is people will dye the orange. Orange. <laughs> that, that, that does not surprise me. So, I might advise caution in eating the peel. Well, yeah, okay, so no, 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 I mean, okay, yes. So the, the caveat is always, is always know how your food was grown, and that should determine how you prepare it. Um, yeah, so for when you, if, if you don't get your fruit from a reliable source where you know it's, you know, grown in as natural a manner as possible, i.e. no pesticides, no, uh, also no pesticides, no fertilizers, yeah, um, there's, there's also a lot of, a lot of fruit gets coated in a food wax, which, you know, they claim is okay to eat, but is it really? Are there longitudinal studies about what happens if you spend your entire life eating food wax? Not really. So, <laughs> uh, I don't trust that either. <clears throat> so, as you can see, ginger peels up quite nicely with the spoon. And also, I can get into some of the more the more tight spaces here. Now, you don't have to have, especially if your ginger has a very thin peel the way mine does, it doesn't have to be perfectly, perfectly um, peeled. And in fact, if, if this had been grown, like if I had grown this myself, and I, I probably wouldn't even necessarily peel it at all. But I didn't grow it myself, and I'm confident that it was grown with not friendly chemicals. So I'd rather not have that in my food. Yeah, orange juice, oranges and orange juice, man, the whole orange industry. So oranges did not used to be sweet at all. Oranges were traditionally sour, which is why if you have older, older recipes, like say, I don't know, pre-18th century recipes, and they call for orange juice, they're calling for orange juice because it's a souring agent, not because it's a sweetening agent. Well, the same is for apples as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, absolutely. We've, most, most actually, most of the fruit we have now we have bred into monstrous versions of its original self to be both sweeter and larger than it originally was. Like the phrase, an apple that keeps dark away, originated from the belief that bad <coughs> or gross tasting food for health. So for um, doing the ginger in the mortar, you can just grate it. I'm just going to go ahead and have some fun with my mortar and pestle, though. So I would just cut it into slightly smaller bits, not chopped per se, but just smaller bits to, for the mashing and grinding in the mortar. Yeah, same, same thing with pomegranates as well. Um, the, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of Persian cuisine calls for pomegranate molasses and it used, that used to be made from sour pomegranates, um, which means that yes, it would be a little sweeter because you concentrate, you know, all of that juice down to make pomegranate molasses, but it certainly wouldn't be as sweet as modern pomegranates are, which of course have been bred again for sweetness. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, when we make horticultural choices like that to breed fruits for sweetness, it usually is at the, frequently it's at the sacrifice of micronutrients. Oh, that's what I was going to say, orange juice, because we're talking about the orange. So orange juice is another thing that you probably shouldn't drink, <laughs> because 
because the way it works is they juice, you know, thousands upon thousands of oranges at once, and then they store it in vats, in oxygenless vats, for a year or more at a time before it actually gets used and, you know, bottled and sold because there are so many oranges that are bred and harvested. And, but the, by that time, the flavor components of the orange juice have completely broken down, so it doesn't taste like orange anymore. So they add back in orange flavor. And in the way the FDA rules work, or the, the USDA rules work, the kind of the, comp the compound that they use to do it, it isn't, you know, they don't, they're not putting in orange oil or something like that. It's this synthetically derived orange flavor, but because of how it's derived and how the rules read, the manufacturers can get away with putting it in there and not calling it orange flavoring. So they don't have to label on their, on their packaging that this is orange juice and orange flavoring or natural flavors or artificial flavors or any kind of flavors. So American orange juice, the reason it never seems to taste like, you know, orange juice does if you do it, you make it fresh, is that's why. So yeah, I also don't recommend drinking orange juice. And honestly, I'm not, I can't imagine, I, although I have no scientific evidence of this specifically, I can't imagine that it is particularly nutritious after that point that the vitamin C has not also broken down to some degree. But I, I, that's just me speculating on that one. So first we mash these slices. And actually a little bit of salt will help the grinding process because the salt provides just a little bit. We don't want too much. The salt provides a kind of gritty sandpaper-like effect. It helps grind. Now this piece really does not want to mash. We just mash each of those pieces. And you will see it breaks down pretty, pretty quickly. Ginger seems tough until you actually get tough with it. So for those who don't know, ginger is a rhizome, and it actually produces a gorgeous, gorgeous flower. Tropical looking, it's tropical, what am I saying? It is tropical, it's a tropical plant. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Dane and what? Can you make a flower out of it? Oh yeah, it's a beautiful flower. Produces a gorgeous, gorgeous flower. Very oh, well, exotic well. looking. Oh, 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 out of, oh no, ginger, oof. God no, dried ginger as a oh as a flower, oof, that would be uh, I couldn't imagine that anything made with <clears throat> that much dried ginger would be edible. <laughs> that would be awful. You know, ginger, dried ginger in small quantities as flavor enhancer slash flavor giver. That's okay. Ginger, ground ginger as the primary thing, oh my god, I think it would also hurt. The other nice thing about mashing, you know, both your ginger and your garlic in a mortar and pestle is that you don't lose nearly as much to the instrument. Because of course in a masher, in a, gr in a press, you always end up with bits you can't extract from the press. And on a grater, you always end up with those, well frequently you end up with those bits that just won't come out of the grater. Especially if you want to find, if you want to use the fine holes. I hate the fine holes on box graters because they really do claim so much. Okay, here we go. Just take a look, kind of check to see if there are any big 
chunks left, and if there are any big chunks left, then go ahead and give it another bit of a, a mash. Use the different techniques, both the circular grinding and the dragging. Okay, I declare this also done. Now, um, if you look at your recipe, when you're preparing your ingredients, you want to look at your recipe and determine what things go together. So in this case, and, and when they go together into the pan specifically, if you look at step three, it says add the garlic and ginger together. So that means that I can actually put my ginger into my garlic bowl, and that will be fine because they're going to go in together at the same time. So this was some jar, some ginger I grated up last night for the madar paneer that I made last night, which is a pea and cheese curry. It's very, very good. And I'm just going to, this was left over, so I'm just going to give this a grind and add it, add it to this. And I'm going to add a little water to make it easier to get out so that it's more slightly more paste-like. I'm uh, currently making some cream cheese, or, well, the, I've already made it. It's now straining. I'm going to make a cheesecake. And I can get organic milk here, but I can't get organic cream cheese. So, I'll make my own. Oh, Dana, did you ever, uh, did you order starters from Cultures for Health? I never went around doing that. Because I actually got my sourdough starter, um, and now that my boys are here for the summer, we're going to be doing some proper sourdough bread making together. With the, and I have the starter for health cultures for it. Are you in a high altitude region at all? <clears throat> I'm sorry, what? Are you in a high altitude region? Oh, no. No, no, no. Not, not even a little bit. I mean, there are mountains all around me, but we're down in the river valley. It's, and it's nothing like, it's nothing like Albuquerque, no. <laughs> God, no, you can actually breathe here like a normal human being. <laughs> oh, how did your, um, what did you make last week? Did the Pollock Paneer, did the flavors develop up or did you add more garam masala like I suggested? I added more and then nothing really changed. I, yeah, I think, I think maybe your spices are just, uh, we're just too old. Right. He's at Costco, right? For? And cranks or coffee and coffee grinders? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, I did. Yep. So, right. like, how many spices do you do, do go bad over time? Well, yeah, bad is, bad is a really strong word. Um, spices lose their potency over time. They go stale is what spices do. Yeah. So, but if they're, so it's, it's the seed thing, right? It, it's the same thing with nuts. It's the same thing with seeds. Spices are just seeds for the most part. Um, that's why I said for the, for the most part. So if, if something is, and even, even with pepper, if the peppers were kept whole, dry, whole, they will retain their flavor for a lot longer than dry ground. So it's, it's kind of all tied together. If the, if the thing is kept whole, then it has natural defenses against oxidation because that's how it evolved. Seeds evolved to be able to last for a really long time without germinating, just in case. So that means they have to retain everything they need to be able to grow a plant. Well, that's what keeps it fresh, so to say. 
The second you break the protective exterior of the thing, whether it's a seed or a dried fruit or whatever, then you expose the inside to oxygen and that is what will cause the flavor compounds to break down, is the, is the oxidation. And that's a gradual process. You can retard it. And of course, warmth accelerates that process. You can retard it with cool, by keeping it cool and out of light. Of course, UV light is always deadly, and photons aren't great either, necessarily. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, um, or standard old visible light, rather, is not, is, not, is not great over the long time term either. So, anything you have, if you can, any spices, flavor givers, the longer you keep them whole, the fresher they will be for flavor-wise the more potent they will be. I mean, even, even seeds, even in their whole state, will eventually, you know, go a little more stale. But they will stay much fresher in their whole state. The second you grind it, you know, the process of rot starts, as it were, of, of decomposition. <clears throat> so that, and that's why, historically, large kitchens have had... Uh, Staff, kitchen staff, whose sole job was to grind spices. In the Middle Ages, there were in the mid in medieval Europe, and I'm confident in medieval India, there were members of you know great households in the kitchen. You know the sort of people who were just starting out. Their sole job was to grind spices day in, day out, fresh from the whole spices that they had. And if they showed promise, they might be allowed to eventually chop some things. <laughs> right, so we now have our ginger and garlic all mashed up, and that's how that looks. So <coughs> ideally now, what I like to do, so for efficiency, I look at the recipe, and if we look at our recipe, the first thing we do is we put ghee in our skillet, and we bring the ghee up to heat, and then we add the whole spices, um, and in this case, we're just going to put in all the whole spices right at the beginning. So that means we need to have all of our whole spices measured up and ready to go before we start doing our onions. So I'm going to go ahead. Hmm? Could you, um, like, remake the, re the recipe later to, like, include, like, what the whole spices are? Because, um, like, some of these recipes I don't make for a while. And I tend to forget I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. What was, what, what was the question? So I tend to sometimes I don't make these recipes again for a while, and I forget right. details. Like, oh, okay. Well, I mean it. it the spices are. Okay. Or it comes added now. So what are the whole spices? Oh, here? right. So the whole spices are cumin seed, okay. cloves the cardamom pods, the bay leaves, and the cinnamon stick. Okay. Those are your whole spices in this, in this recipe. <clears throat> and then, and that contrasts with the garam masala, which is ground. Okay. And, and so the reason, the reason that we're adding the whole spices now to the ghee is because we want those whole spices to completely infuse the ghee because of course, the, there, in any given whole spice, there are fat soluble flavor compounds and there are water soluble compounds. And so we want to actually to get both out of this. So to get the fat soluble compounds out, we're going to, with heat especially, we're going to fry them in the, the whole spices in the ghee first for just 30 seconds, just not long enough to burn the spices. And then with that infused ghee, we will then add the onion and then the infused, the flavor infused ghee will infuse the onions with the flavor from those whole spices, which will also, of course, continue to fry as the onions fry. And then later on in the wet stage, we have, we always have our, often we have our fat stage and our wet stage in our curries. In the wet stage, we will add our ground garam masala, and that will pull out different flavor compounds than were pulled out from the whole spices. So that is a very frequent aspect of many Indian curries is you might add the same spice multiple times at different stages because you're going to extract different flavors from that same spice depending on the method of extracting the flavor. 
So because I want to have all these whole spices just ready to go, I'm going to go ahead and measure them up into a single bowl so that I can just dump that bowl into my hot ghee. So we have our two black cardamom pots. Like I said, they have that nice smoky smell. We have our Tej Pot Pep. And actually, I forgot I'm doubling this recipe, so... Two more of that. And then we have one tablespoon of cumin seed. And so you might think, wow, that's a lot of cumin seed. But remember, it's going in whole. So that means that it does, it's, you know, not going to be as potent as if we put in, say, two tablespoons of ground cumin. So there's one, there's two. And in fact, our garam masala does contain ground cumin. So that's why we'll be adding that in the lower quantity at the water stage. <clears throat> Cloves are analgesic. Hmm. Never thought about this. I wonder if the cloves in uh, curries might help minimize the impact of the spice that some, some members of the subcontinent so adore in terrifying levels of heat. And then our cinnamon stick. And my cinnamon sticks are about two inches long. It's actually like three inches. So I'm just going to toss in a whole cinnamon stick. Um, and if you've never seen someone make a cinnamon stick, by which I mean actually put it all together, you should, you should look it up on YouTube. It's fascinating because they literally carve off layers of the bark in these sheets from, of the cinnamon tree because that's what cinnamon is. It's the bark of the cinnamon tree. And it comes off in these, these rolled up kind of sheets, long sheets, like about this wide and this long. And then these, these women in Sri Lanka, they literally just sit there and they pack each layer into each other. So it, this is not what the bark looks like. The bark is just one individual thin layer. And then they pack each of these layers by hand into these sticks and then cut them. So this is, it's quite a labor to make, to get cinnamon stick to your table, <laughs> as it were. Okay, so here are our whole spices, and that means that when it is time for the heat, or to put them to the warm ghee, we have it all ready to go, and we just dump it. Because what you don't want to have happen <clears throat> is for your ghee to start burning, because you're still measuring spices. And that's also why you want to make sure that you have your onions completely prepared, and your ginger and garlic completely prepared, um, so that when it's their stage to go, it can be added. Because if these spices sit in the ghee for too long, they will burn. And burnt spices are awful, which means you have to start from completely scratch and whatever, up to whatever stage your burning happens. So everything staged and ready to go. Now we do know that the onions are going to be caramelizing. And so that usually takes 10 to 20 minutes, depending on what's happening. So we can go ahead and start cooking at this stage because while the onions are caramelizing, we can then finish preparing the rest of the recipe. Right. So this is an art of recipe. You read through your recipe, you see what, what stages can be maximized for efficiency. This is one of them. So what level of heat are you cooking the spices at? Uh, medium heat. Yep, so go ahead, let's go ahead and heat up our pan and I'm gonna go ahead and switch now to the other camera. Okay, the pan camera. So dear viewer, never be afraid of the fat. <laughs> fat is your friend, as long as it is a healthy fat that lived a healthy life. And healthy fats are actually saturated, especially if it comes from an animal that was fed what it should be. In the case of cows, they should eat nothing but grass. So if your fat is grass fed, <laughs> If your cow is grass-fed, your fat will be grass-fed and will also be good for you in terms of both the fatty acid profile and the micronutrient profile. So we're actually going to put quite a bit of ghee in here. So five tablespoons, you know, is like a third of a cup-ish, basically. 
<clears throat> and and we want that. We want it all. This dish is not a low-fat dish. And eventually, when we add the potatoes, the potatoes are going to absorb a lot of that yummy fat. So bring your pan up to medium heat. And of course, depending on your stove, you're really going to have to figure out what that means. You know, what is, what is medium heat on your stove? So we want that ghee to be melted. So basically, we want to add the ghee or the spices, honestly, we're going to go ahead and add them at the melted stage. The ghee is melted. Just want to swirl it around so that my mountain of ghee eventually turns into liquid. I'm going to encourage this to melt a little more quickly by breaking it up instead of it being a monolith of ghee. There we go. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and once the ghee is melted, I'm going to go ahead and add my spices and um, so I'm adding it kind of before it gets hot, hot, and I know that, and that's okay. I would like it to start infusing now. Um, so for those who don't really have much of a sense of smell, I keep my eye on the cumin seed. And once it starts darkening, that's kind of the stage at which you will add your onions. But for those who do have a sense of smell, then once they're fragrant, then you add your onion. And depending on the heat of your ghee, that could take only 30 seconds. It might take up to a minute. This is kind of the touchy-feely part of cooking. I'm unfortunately rather congested. <laughs> I'm just recovering from bronchitis, so um, this is going to take, it's harder for me to smell than it might normally be, which means I almost have to put my face in the pan. Mm, okay, getting some nice smell there. So I'm going to go ahead and add my onions. And if your ghee is starting to smoke, then turn your heat down. So you definitely don't want it to burn. Okay. And go my onions. Use my rubber scraper, of course, to extract every little bit. You don't want to waste. So many people don't use their rubber scrapers in the proper fashion, and they end up wasting so much food over, over their lives, actually, because they leave so much in the bowls. I'm having to teach my boys how to properly use rubber scrapers so that they don't leave an entire serving of whatever in the bowl and wash it down the sink. You know, food waste is already such a huge issue. I know, you're, you're kind of focusing on the wrong area of food waste. Oh no, that's, that's, I said it's already such a huge issue. Then doing that just exacerbates it. Oh no, there's the food, the amount of food waste is horrifying. It's, yeah. Well, it, and it's not just food waste, you know. So many people, they get to the end of their bottle of, or their tube of toothpaste, for instance. And they don't cut it open to realize that there's actually 15 or 20 more brushings worth of toothpaste left inside of it. You know, they just throw it away or they get to the end of their sunblock tube or bottle 
and don't cut it open or realize that the manufacturers have intentionally designed this packaging so that you will waste and have to buy more frequently. <clears throat> I know my, for my expensive skincare products, um, if I didn't cut them open and use every last bit, I would literally be throwing away about $10 per bottle. <laughs> Okay, so once we have our onions added and your heat is medium, we don't, we don't stir them very often. And actually, we're going to add a little bit of salt, just sprinkle some salt on, just a light layer all the way around. And the salt is going to help. It will draw out the water and the help your, and also with it, the sugars, <laughs> the natural sugars or the compounds that will become sugars from the onions and that will help it caramelize more quickly than otherwise. So that's a trick you can always, if your recipe calls for salt anyway, add, add some salt at the caramelization, onion caramelization stage, and your onions will therefore caramelize more quickly. So for caramelization, that means that at the beginning, we don't stir it very often. We let that bottom layer first form, start forming a foam, start forming that Maynard reaction sugar. And then we scrape it all up and stir it and then let it sit for a little while longer. So the stirring rate will accelerate as the process goes on, but in the early stages of caramelization, it's pretty minimal. Right, so now we're gonna move back to preparing the rest of our ingredients. So I will switch the camera angle back to the prep. Area. Right, oh, my tea. Huh. <clears throat> so an item we didn't talk about was our peppers. Um, and these are actually what are called cucumber peppers. So they are mi minimally spicy. Now, Make sure that you wash your peppers well, because especially if they come from conventional farming, then they're covered in chemicals that you really definitely should not be eating. No matter what the USDA says from its six month st safety study where nothing happened, where somehow cancer didn't spring up in six months. I, yeah, anyway. <clears throat> so we're going to be chopping these up now. Um, Peppers don't just have heat, they, they also contain umami. So just like the tomatoes, they are flavor enhancers. And that's why so many dishes are built on a base of onions, tomatoes, and pepper, because that's like the trifecta of flavor, common, of flavor creation. Here's the interesting thing about peppers. The seeds aren't really hot in and of themselves. They are hot because they are attached to the ribs of the pepper, which are where the actual heat comes from. So by removing the ribs of your peppers, you can actually minimize the heat pretty efficient and the seeds because the seeds are coated in the thing that, that cause they're connected. So they're coated in the thing from the ribs. So by removing the seeds and the ribs, you can reduce the heat of your peppers if you wish to do that. Of course, if you, if you want the full spice, then don't bother doing this process. But um, I only like enough spice to enhance the flavor of my food. I'm not into painful spice. And I did not grow up in the Indus Valley, so my level of spice is what I consider to be painful is definitely lower than what uh, someone who's grown up their whole life with spice would think. So I'm just going to go ahead and use, actually, I don't know why I'm using a knife. I never use a knife to do this. I use a spoon to remove the ribs and the seeds, right? You just drag it down the length and it gets that rip off really nicely and takes out all the seeds as well. <clears throat> and I try to keep all that evilness in a separate spot on my cutting board for a quick and easy removal. Now, once you've been handling safe, safe pepper handling, once you've been handling hot peppers, and then that means anything other than a bell pepper, basically, um, wash your hands really, really well with lots of soap. Those those oils from the pepper are pernicious, and if you say, we're too touch your eye, or 
to go and powder your nose and use your hands in sensitive areas, then that, those oils will transfer. They will most assuredly transfer. I have a Swedish friend who is making southwestern style, southwestern style chili, and he was, using, he was using hatched chilies that he managed to somehow get in Sweden, and I don't know how he did that, but he uh, was chopped up his onions, his, his chilies, and then he went and powdered his nose and forgot about the fact that he had been chopping chilies. And when the guests arrived for dinner, they found him reposing in a bowl of yogurt to help cool things off. Okay, so if we look back at my screen with the cooking, because I've got it double pinned right now, the way I tell, got a light. the way I tell if the onions are starting to brown is I can actually, you can actually look and you can see that some of the edges of some of the onions are starting to brown. So at that phase, I go ahead and give it a stir. Scraping up any browning that's sticking to the pan so that it ends up on the onions, not on the pan. Because we want all of that browning, but you don't want it on the bottom of the pan for very long because it will start to burn after a certain amount of time. So we want to scrape up all of those sugars that are forming so that they get stirred onto the onions and kind of become one with the onions. Okay. Well, I will let that sit for a little while longer. I also try to nestle these... Try to nestle the spices down into the mixture a little bit more so that it's not just floating on top of the onions. Sort of immersed in the onions. There we go. Back to our peppers. <laughs> so now I'm going to cut this one lengthwise. And as the recipe says, if you like more heat, add more chili peppers. I only like a medium heat, and also certain members of my household, uh, their digestive tracts actually can't react very, very poorly to capsaicin. And then we're just going to go down the length and chop this nice and fine. This should basically vanish into the dish. This should not be a vegetable in the dish that is easily identifiable. Just like our onions, this is a flavor giver. I'm just going to give it a little chop in this direction. If you see any biggish chunks, just go ahead and abuse them into the shape that they should have. <clears throat> so this is basically the size we are looking for. Oh, there was a chunk hiding. And scrape that into a bowl, put it off to the side. So I do believe for those who are watching this in the sort of May through August season that peas pods, you can actually get fresh peas now. And I will recommend it if you can get them to make this dish with fresh peas because it's completely, it's very, very different. The peas are actually really meaty and, and substantial if they're fresh. So it's a very, I, I prefer it because the peas actually have something to contribute to the dish. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and check your onions again. So next, we're going to go ahead and prepare our potato. 
Um, and depending on your potato, if you have a red skinned potato, you do not need to peel it. If you've got something with a very thin skin and it's, you know, another color, you do not need to peel it. But these, the skins on this are pretty thick. So I'm going to go ahead and peel this. I actually, a lot of potato peels have uh, contained chemicals that, again, were probably designed to prevent animals from eating them, but we've seen past that. Um, but you really shouldn't. They're not good for you, and they're inflammatory. So they're only in the skin, though. So if you remove the skin, then you remove those inflammatory chemicals. Red-skinned potatoes have contain less of them in the peel. It's sort of unfortunate because there are so many micronutrients in the peel, but... So I see in restaurants where people like uh, boil in water and peel them. Is that Oh, um, so if you were going to do mashed potatoes, that's so that's a different thing. So if you're going to do mashed potatoes, yeah, I would cook them. I would cook them in peel entirely, and then peel them after they've cooked, and that's that will prevent your potatoes, your mashed potatoes, from becoming gluey, starchy messes. Yeah, that's a that's actually a mashed potato hack for getting fluffy, yummy mashed potatoes every time. Cook them in their skin peel them after they've cooked, and then mash the butter and fat in first, so if it's cream cheese or butter or whatever, and then add your liquid. And then that will prevent the, them from becoming gluey messes. Okay, so as I said, as the onions start to caramelize, the process is, it, it accelerates, it's exponential, it's not a linear function. <laughs> And you have to figure, you have to know your burner, even, or your stove. You know, certain burners tend to have hotter spots, have hot spots than cool spots, relatively speaking. So you need to know where yours are and ensure that your onions are getting mixed across those and not always staying in the same region of your pan. <clears throat> so back to our, back to our recipe. So we're going to cut these into inch pieces, and that's kind of a common size, whether it's um, ghee, I mean, yeah, ghee, sorry, paneer, or in, for vegans, tofu. Right, so roughly, roughly inch pieces. No one is measuring your potatoes, though, so if some are bigger and some are smaller, it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing how much potatoes have transformed Asian, various Asian cuisines as well. I mean, and European cuisines, honestly. Again, potatoes didn't make an appearance in cuisine worldwide, outside of the New World, until the 17th, and in some cases, 18th century. Okay, I'm going to take this opportunity to go ahead and wash my hands before I do something stupid with them. <laughs> Make sure to keep an eye on your onions as you're preparing. It's easy to get lost in the ingredient preparation process. And you can see in my in mine, they really are starting to caramelize quite nicely. And if, if things are happening too quickly in your pan, you can always turn the heat down a little bit. You know, if it's if it's not caramelizing but just burning, turn your heat down. The idea is you want the heat to be high enough that it extracts the sugars, low enough that it doesn't burn them before other sugars, other liquids are extracted. So, I just need to turn my heat down a little bit. Okay, for caramelization, you generally want a medium low heat. But it also depends on your stove what medium low heat means. So hence why there's a touchy feely component to this cooking. All right, so we have our potatoes. I have 
keys already measured out and ready to go. Tomato paste. <clears throat> so tomato paste, um, if you have a big can of it, and obviously it's very rare you're ever going to use all of it, like a big can, one of those jumbo cans. A hack for your tomato paste is once you open it and start using it, to actually get an ice cube tray and divvy out your, the tomato paste from the can into the ice cube tray and then freeze it. And then you have serving sized uh, tomato paste ready to go when you need it and it won't mold that way. So for a double recipe, I'm going to need eight tablespoons. And there are 10 tablespoons in this can. So I'm going to do a very cook thing. <laughs> I'm going to eyeball this. Basically, I'm just going to try to leave two tablespoons in the jar or in the can. And the reality is that that's the way most people who make curry regularly do it. They don't really measure very much. Okay, that's about eight tablespoons. And eight tablespoons is actually half a cup, because four tablespoons is a quarter cup. Righty ho. Okay, checking my onions. Definitely some nice browning happening here. And add a little bit more salt to encourage a bit more of the caramelization. This, this salting technique is especially useful <clears throat> uh, for dishes that need to be salted anyway. So for instance, we're not adding broth to this. Broth is very salty. If I were going to be adding broth to this dish, I might be less generous with the salting during the caramelization phase, but because we're, the only time we add salt to this is when we add the salt. It doesn't, it's not a component of any of the ingredients. I can go ahead and, you know, caramelize using the salt. If, however, I were cooking a dish that, to which I were going to be adding broth, which has salt, I might use um, some kind of sugar then to help caramelize the onions. Whatever your sugar of choice is, coconut sugar, damara sugar. Don't recommend using refined sugar for many, many reasons, but you know, you do you, boo. Okay, while my onions finish caramelizing, I'm going to take this opportunity to remove the chemical warfare from my cutting board and dispose of it. And just be aware that the part of your cutting board where the pepper detritus was sitting will be dangerous to anything you put on it. Now, if you like spice, it doesn't matter. But if you cut anything on this area until you wash your cutting board, it will pick up that spice. Checking my onions. You'll of course notice how much the onions have reduced through this caramelization process. 
Mm, smells so good. You know, spices do taste really good, but a lot of these spices also are, are rich in antioxidants and bioflavonoids and um, all sorts of components that are just really actually good for our systems. And these, these, these spices really do actually have a lot of act, medicinally act, pharmaceutical active ingredients, ph pharmaceutically active compounds. Make sure my onions are distributed to the surface of the pan. <clears throat> so once our onions caramelize, we'll be adding the garlic and ginger. And we're going to let that cook for about three minutes. We want to sort of, you know, extract flavor. We don't want it to burn. And then we'll be adding our chilies, our lamb, and our tomato paste and cooking before we finally add our potatoes. And um, in the case of fresh peas, our peas. Because fresh peas take a little bit longer, a lot longer to cook than frozen peas. And these were in the fridge so long that they actually started sprouting. It's kind of cute. It's OK. We'll go with it. Actually, sprouted peas are more micronutriently rich than unsprouted ones because if a pea sprouts like this, that means it's ready to form a plant, which means that it, all of the micronutrients that are contained in what is in essence a seed, you know, have now been unlocked to feed that plant. Whereas the ones that haven't yet sprouted, those micronutrients haven't actually been unlocked yet. So you won't be able to access the micronutrients in this pea as much as the ones in this pea. That's why sprouting grains or sprouting seeds is very beneficial. It's not just, it's not just hooey, fooey, crunchy, you know, hippie, hippie, whatever. It's scientifically, it's a scientific fact. Sprouting your grains will make them much more nutri nutritious for you and will also make them more digestible for you. Same thing with seeds. Because all of these grains and seeds and, and beans, they all have... They all feature chemicals that are designed to prevent us from eating them, that punish us for eating them. There are ways around that, but we've stopped using most of the ways around that punishment, and we just accept the punishment, and we don't realize that we're accepting the punishment. That's why there's so much more autoimmune, so many more allergies, so much more infl inflammation it's from eating seeds that have not been prepared in a way that prevents them from inflaming us because we've stopped taking the time to prepare our food properly. We've industrialized all these, all these foodstuffs and it's cheaper for the manufacturers to not apply those stages to the food preparation process and we've accepted that in exchange for cheap food. Cheap, overly abundant food, I might add. Okay, so this is about the level of caramelization that I'm going for. I will pin this window so that you can see it up close. Where is my, there it is. Move pin. Okay, so this is about the level of darkness that we are looking for here. Because we started with purple onions, obviously they start out darker, so this might look burnt. It's not. These are just the way purple onions look when they're caramelized. So this is what we're going for. So give it a final, give it a final round. Now there's so much ghee in this that it's uh, highly likely you will not actually be forming much, the, not much of the brown will actually be sticking to the pan and that's great. That's better. You want it to be on your onion. So I'm going to go ahead now and add my ginger and garlic.
and stir that in. Smells so delightful. Give it a shake. And depending on how low you turned your flame, you want to bring it back up to medium heat for this stage. So for those who are interested in historical cookery, um, presumably, honestly, as far as I can tell, the way to return this dish back to its medieval original would be to remove the potatoes and remove the tomatoes and then basically you end up with the you know all the ingredients that are left are ones that were readily available before the Colombian exchange before Columbus brought all those foodstuffs to the old world <clears throat> old is of course from our perspective obviously the people who were living in the Americas didn't think of themselves as the new world, they thought of themselves as the world. <laughs> the way we thought of ourselves as the world, we being Europeans and Asians and Africans. Now there are, um, the ginger and garlic have uh, compounds that will burn easily if they're allowed to stick to the pan. So make sure you're stirring and not allowing any of it to stick to the bottom of the pan. Mm. Gosh, that smells so nice. And we're going to do this for about three minutes. It's been about two minutes now, I think. So my onions are caramelizing. Your onions are still caramelizing? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you, have you added a little more salt? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Okay, so at this stage, go ahead and add our green chilies. Stir those in. And our tomato paste. Oh yeah, could I see the lamb you're using? The lamb? Yeah. yeah. Where is your lamb? And it's just, it's ground? It's just ground. Okay. It's just ground lamb, like, like ground beef. Just ground lamb. Oh, that's, oh, minced, right. I wish you had asked about that. So minced is the British word for ground. When it comes to meat, minced meat pie is a ground meat pie. Sorry, I've, I've, I've lived internationally for so long that I forgot that Americans might not understand the word minced. Uh, yeah, minced lamb, it's just ground lamb. Uh, so if your lamb is not ground already, you can go ahead and cut it into chunks and put it in a food processor. Okay, so as we can see, we have stirred in the tomato paste and the green chili and let that cook for a minute or two just to get nice and incorporated. And now at this stage, we will go ahead and add our ground 
Go ahead and actually turn your heat up a little bit. Make sure it's a sort of slightly higher than medium. And then we're going to go ahead and add our ground lamb in and start breaking it up, but don't, don't break it up too much yet. We're going to kind of let it fry a little bit, get a little brown on the bottom, to sort of push the tomato paste and onion mixture out of the way. Just to get a little bit of that Maynard browning effect going. Of course, if your pan isn't big enough for this, well, it is what it is. <laughs> And the reason we don't want to break it up too much too soon is that if you break it up too soon, then a lot of moisture is going to leak out of it. Whereas if it stays in sort of these blocks for a little bit longer and, and firms up, then more of the moisture will actually be contained within the lamb. So. Starting to brown a little bit on the bottom, as you can see. So I'm going to start breaking it up. And mashing it in, mixing it in. My mixture. Mashing it in. You might want to turn your heat up a little bit, especially if your meat is cold when it goes in. Ideally, in an ideal world, it's best to let your meat come to room temperature before adding it to any pan. Mine was not out long enough for that to happen, but there it is. So if you add, the point is, if you add cold meat to the pan, you may have to turn the heat up a little bit to compensate for that. So just breaking up these chunks. Smells so nice. see we're getting it all incorporated the tomato tomato onion chili mixture with all of course all those spices into your meat okay and then just want to make sure any last little chunks are broken up because we want we want we want the sauce that eventually will form here to be entirely distributed in between all these lovely little pieces of meat. So we don't want any sort of biggish chunks. Uh, 
Okay. Scrape up any bits that are sticking, caramelizing to the pan. That's good flavor. We don't want it to burn. So the next stage is to add our potatoes. So yeah, this is cooked for about three minutes at this point, a little bit more depending on how long it took you to mix everything in. So we go ahead and add our potatoes and then we will add water and we will bring that up to a good simmer. And the, the idea with the water is you want your potatoes to be more or less entirely covered. I mean, we're going, you know, the recipe calls for 250 milliliters per, per, per one recipe. But, you know, uh, you kind of have to eyeball this sort of stuff. Depending on how big your pan is, how much is in the pan, et cetera, et cetera, it will kind of determine how much water you need to add at the start because the idea is this water is going to cook the potatoes. So just so you know, 250 milliliters is about a cup-ish, a little bit more than a cup, but you know, and for my, for my, <laughs> uh, my imperial measurement peeps out there. But as you can see, adding 200, that which would be, I already added twice, which is about two cups of water, didn't quite really give us the amount of water we're going to need to cook because the water is going to cook off. Right? The amount of water that's in there now is not the amount of water that's going to be there at the end of this process. It's going to, some of it's going to be absorbed by the potatoes, some of it's going to cook off. So we want there to be enough that we start with a kind of soupy, not thin, but soupy mixture so that the potatoes can be completely submerged. And then that's just going to cook down. So this is again, this is the, this is the touchy-feely aspect of of cooking. This is why we do these, why we do classes, because the recipe do, recipes aren't going to tell you that kind of thing. These are things you have to know. You have to learn through, through experience. Some people don't learn it and they wonder why the recipes never turn out. Well, it's because recipes won't necessarily give you all the details you need. So why do they even exist? I'm, I'm sorry, what, Dana? Why do they even exist? Recipe, you know, it's funny. Throughout history, recipes have almost always been aimed at people who already understand the fundamentals of cooking and they understand these touchy-feely aspects. Or they've been taught them by, by whoever came before them. By whomever came before them. So, you know, the recipes provide you with the basic instructions and, and measurements and whatnot, but a lot of those measurements cooking, not baking, a lot of measurements in cooking are going to have to be varied based on your own, the cooking equipment, the humidity in the room, how hot your fire actually gets. It's, there's so many factors. You just develop a feel for it over time. You know, medieval recipes are, are fascinatingly vague. They are hardly ever have any sorts of measurements. And um, the the steps you take are not necessarily always in actually the right order. <laughs> uh, so, but again, those, those cookbooks weren't aimed at novice cooks. They were aimed at people who already knew the dishes, A, and already knew how to cook in general. So most cookbooks are aimed at people who already know how to cook, even in the modern world. Now, for good basic are cookbooks that actually normally explain the fund and illustrate the fundamental steps of each recipe. America's Test Kitchen has the best. When it comes to that, America's Test Kitchen 100%. Okay. They actually provide cookbooks where even though, even though the recipes are interesting and flavorful and they're not basic recipes per se, they'll explain, well, in this recipe you have to do this and here's an illustration of the technique step by step so you can use it. Or see page blah 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 for a step by step illustration of this technique, you know. Right. America's Test Kitchen. It's a good good show. It's a good it's a television show, but it's they also produce cookbooks from their show. And the idea with America's Test Kitchen is they actually take a, a recipe and they test thirty different 
varieties of the recipe and decide which one produces the best product. And if they need to, they actually make a recipe that combines aspects of each of the recipes to create the best outcome as per their tasters. But that doesn't mean you should stop taking my classes. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> this is coming up here to a simmer. It's not quite roiling, but it's it's approaching it. And you can apply a little more heat, you know, to get your to get your dish up to a simmer. Once you've added liquid, you can always add a little more heat to, to accelerate the heating process because it's this is not milk, it's water. It's not going to break if it gets too hot or some other dairy product. Mm, look at all that yummy fat floating on top. That, my friends, is going to coat rice or naan so beautifully and be partially absorbed by the potatoes in this dish. Mm, so good. Okay, now, this is the stage where if you have fresh peas like I have, you will add them. If you have frozen peas, do not add them now. Frozen peas really don't have to get added until almost the end of cooking. Like the last couple of minutes of cooking. Of course, if you like mushy peas, if you like your peas to be really, really, really cooked, then you could go ahead and add them now, but I don't like my peas like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and add my peas. Stir them in. This is not so. Not this curry. I'm like sorry. What? I'm just saying this is not very gravy like like the other curries. Yeah. No. It's a it's a completely different kind of thing in that regard. Yeah. This is a non creamy curry. Now, um, one of the potential garnishes for this dish would be a little bit of uh, yogurt on top at the end, sort of drizzled on for, for visual effect. And, and there are actually recipes for a creamy, creamy kima, kima matar, where you do add some cream at the end. This is, this is just not that variety. In fact, <laughs> I will say that if I, when I make a large pot like this and I have lots, then, you know, maybe for the first couple of times I eat it, I'll go with the non-creamy version. And then for variety, I'll add some cream on the next reheating <laughs> or the next, the, you know, the next several times I eat it just to uh, vary the dish a bit. But I now have my three stepsons with me, and they are ginormous growing children, and so I don't think this will probably last very long. I think it probably added more water. Probably added more water. Um, if, okay, so if you've added more water than you actually think you need, then go ahead and turn your heat up a little bit to kind of accelerate that boiling down process. Okay. So for this, you will need to stir occasionally to prevent things from sticking to the bottom and burning because what happens is that things settle out. So yes, there might seem like there's lots of liquid on the top, but it's literally the liquid is on the top because the heavy matter has settled out. And some of that heavy matter is that very lovely sweet mash of caramelized onions and pepper and tomato paste. And if that sticks to the bottom and burns, you will be a sad person. Especially the higher your heat is, the more you will want, more often you will want to stir and scrape the bottom as you do. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to turn this down a little bit. I did turn the heat up to bring it up to a sort of rollicking simmer. You wash your hands. Wash your hands. So go ahead and just let that cook, cook, cook. Mm 
Oh, that's what's in the camera. Right. I've got a couple little pieces of potato left. I'll just pop those in. Go ahead and put the cutting board in the sink. Recording in progress. So we're basically going to cook this until the potatoes are tender and it has reached the desired consistency we want. <clears throat> but along the way, we're going to be adding our garam masala. So, um, but we don't add the garam masala really until the very end. So we're, we're not trying to drag flavor out of it. We really want it to be a sort of last, last minute addition as a final seasoning. Could I remove the scum? Can you remove the what? Scum. The, the, you know the foam? You know the foam? You have a... Uh, uh, no, nor, that's not... Normally, I'm not certain why you're getting foam. <laughs> um, why you're getting scum. Can you tell if it's just starch from the potato? I or is it from the I meat? Can. Well, hmm. well... Oh no, just leave that. That's fine. Okay. No, no, no. That's that's fine. And uh, yeah, in the in the meanwhile, I guess if you uh, ha if you've want to make rice, you can go ahead and, you know, get started on your rice if you haven't already done so. But you told me to start a while ago. Well, yes, but I was just observing for anyone who uh, hasn't already started at this point. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Are talking you know, to I So, uh, honestly, in general, if you know that you're kind of a rice-eating person and you eat a lot of dishes, you know, you have curry kind of on a regular basis. I like to make my rice um, in mass, like large quantity of it, and then just have it in the fridge because it's actually better for you after it's been refrigerated. Like I said last week, um, you get the resistant starch effect if you make it and then chill it and then reheat mm -hmm. it. And then if you reheat it and then chill it again, you get even more resistant starch. So the rice is actually much better for you and much more digestible in that state and much happier for your intestinal microflora. Hi. Mm. 
I bring them in the big plate. Bigger is always better. No, oh, actually, not not when it comes to cooking. When it comes to cooking, more is more. Yes, yeah, so that's my admonishment to all those cooks out there. Always pick the bigger option when it comes to vessels for cooking, whether it's mixing bowls or cutting boards or, or pans or plates. Always pick the bigger option because you need space to prepare ingredients and to cook. So it's better to have a bowl that's too big for your, you know, eggs that you're whisking than a bowl that's too small. It's better to have a plate that's really nice and big for grating cheese because then it catches all of the cheese rather than a plate where the cheese ends up getting grated halfway off of it or off of it in half. And we were shelling these peas last night and we ended up with peas everywhere. I actually originally bought the peas in the pods to do a medieval recipe because there are medieval peas in pods recipes, but I never got around to that. And the peas were starting to sprout, <laughs> so I decided to use them for this curry. But I have to say, I really, this is the first time I've ever used fresh peas, and I like them so much more than the frozen peas. So much more. I see a whole lot of peas shoving in. In our future. <laughs> yeah, my, my children, my, my youngest perceives a, a whole lot of pea shelling in his immediate future. And if we get another bag of shelled pea, peas in shell, then yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Want to hear something you said, Rachel? If we take already got up to basically as much as I did with the, this one, Or yeah, like I said, it's it's definitely easier for large quantities is to just use the standard grater. I mean, there's no such thing as too much cheese. We just add more cheese into the dish. So no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that there can be too much cheese in any dish. Yes, for those who might be watching from out there, you might not have heard the question from the background from my youngest who's preparing the ingredients for dinner, which is going to be cheesy pasta. And, and uh, he, uh, he asked if I minded if he grated too much cheese. Well, dear viewer, let me make my position on this question perfectly clear. I don't believe in such a thing as too much cheese. Rachel, would you like some pasta in your pasta? I'm sorry, what? Would you like some pasta like some in your pasta in your Yeah, exactly. The cheese should be the main thing. The pasta is just a garnish. So uh, what's the tell for the potatoes already? Okay, so the potatoes should you should be able to insert a fork and it goes through with no resistance. So, of course, as you're cooking along, if the water evaporates too quickly, you need to add more. Um, especially for those living in high desert climes, that might happen <laughs> very quickly. Like us. No, not like us. We don't live in a desert climb anymore, you know? <laughs> he lives in a high desert climb. This is not a desert climb, and it is not high. It's hot, but it's not high. This is... This is, this is a tropical climate, kiddo, at least in the summer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So every time you scrape the pan and stir, make sure that you kind of press the potatoes back down into it so that they cook. So for those who haven't heard my rice lecture before, if you're going to make rice, make certain that you rinse it thoroughly before cooking it because, and you want to rinse it in cold water because if you don't, you will end up with starchy, pasty nastiness instead of beautiful individual grains of rice with good integrity, good structural integrity rather. I guess I don't care how, in, how much integrity the rice has, but it should have structural integrity. Now, different people like their kima, their matar kima, to have different consistencies. I really like mine to be thickish. So once the potatoes are done, then you can decide how thick you want your curry to be. Some people like, like I said, some people like theirs really soupy. I don't. <laughs> I like mine to be thick like stew. Gonna give the potatoes a test. Oh, that one that went in pretty good, pretty well on that potato. So you want to, you'll actually want to test a couple of potatoes because you know, and and go for if you have different size potatoes, always aim for one that's the biggest in size to test, because of course the largest ones are the ones that cook the slowest. So those being done is very important. Now on mine, on mine. It is done. Well, pretty much I've done a test on a couple of different pieces. Well, actually, there's a couple of pieces that are still a little resistant. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and let it stew for a little bit longer. Make sure. Of course, if you don't mind crunchy potatoes, then, you know, you do you, boo. But I personally like my potatoes to be tender. Now, when it comes to conserving water, I'm a big fan of conserving water. And so what I normally like to do when I'm rinsing my rice is to actually save the water. Is to actually save the water in a bowl, the rinse water, and feed that to my plants. So that I'm not just, yeah. If I have a yard, then I feed it to my grass. Unfortunately, I'm currently living in an apartment where I have no plants. I'm in the middle of a very densely developed city so there's not even grass on which I can throw my water so I just have to rinse this down the drain but if you have a yard if you have plants use the rinse water from your rice to feed them rather than just throwing it out In fact, for my European friends, uh, my German friends, because I know this is how it's built in Germany, you actually get charged for both your input and your output. So if you feed your water to your plants, then you will pay less in sewage bills for your wastewater. 
So it also has an economic benefit, not just an ecological benefit. Okay, my curry is the potatoes are done, and it's a pretty darned good thickness here. I'm just going to let it cook a little bit more. I, I do want it a little bit thicker, but the potatoes are definitely done. And so at the very end here, we will be, of course, adjusting for uh, salt. And some of you may be asking, well, what about pepper? No. <laughs> the pepper is actually a big component of your garam masala, which we're about to add here. I mean, if you really feel it needs more pepper, I guess. But that's not, uh, that's not an aspect of Indian cuisine is post-seasoning with pepper. It's, it's part of this, the garam masala spice mixture. <clears throat> and in fact, in dishes where there is no garam masala spice mixture, what you will notice that then usually peppercorns, whole peppercorns are added at some stage, usually in the fatty stage. Yeah, looking good. And it smells good too. How does that smell, boys? Can you smell it anymore? Probably not, huh? Kind of can. We've all been in it for so long. <laughs> no, I meant I I meant that we couldn't really notice the smell anymore because we've just been in it so long, you know, immersed in it. Yeah. Basically, we have to exit, breathe some outside air, come back in, and then you can smell the spice again. Oh, good. Good for you, kiddo. I can't. Oh, oh, I see. So now it's fresh? <laughs> Apparently, my middle child can disengage his sense of smell and just not use it, and then re-engage it when he wants it. That's a handy no. trick. No, it's not my sense of smell that I do. I'm like a snake. <laughs> I don't smell, smell the air. Okay. I can taste it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually does. Okay, so this has reached the level of... Has it? No, I want it a little thicker. Sorry, I do like my curry to be quite thick. You can have different people like... No. So, the potatoes are very soft. Okay, so how is your, is your, do you, is it, how, so you have to decide, do you want your curry to be thicker or thinner? Well, um, um, do I have to worry about having thinner or thicker? Do you have to worry about what? The potatoes becoming mush. Generally not, I mean, it kind of depends on the cultivar of potato. You know, they have different, you can tell though, I mean, are they already falling apart? Uh, well, if I, I Right, but if you stir it, do they fall apart? No. no. Okay, then no, you're fine. Um, and have you added your frozen peas yet? Uh, not yet. Uh, not yet. Now, now, would, now that your potatoes are tender, now is the time to add the frozen peas. Okay. So, yeah, dear viewer, if you are using frozen peas, I would go ahead and add them now that the potatoes are tender. And once you add the frozen peas, you might have to turn your heat up a little bit. Um, to actually bring it back up to a uh, cooking temperature in a reasonable amount of time. actually thinking about just doing a video, a quick video on making basmati rice and including that as one of the links with, for the registration. <laughs> if you want, or whatever the rice is relative for the recipe, if you would like to make rice to go with this recipe, please see this video. <laughs> Right 
Oh, uh, you would add them right, uh, you add the potatoes and then you bring it to a simmer and as soon as the water is simmering, you add the peas. Okay. Because the, the potatoes take just a little bit more time than the peas. Good question. Um, so for those who maybe couldn't couldn't hear, uh, the question was if um, you're using fresh peas, it was a refresher, if you're using fresh peas, then they should be added after you bring the, the add the potatoes and bring it up to a simmer. Okay, so as you can see for mine, I really like mine so that there's almost no actual liquid left. The only liquid really in here is mostly melted butter and rendered lamb's fat, or melted ghee and rendered lamb's fat, and that's good. That's the way I prefer my, uh, my kima matar to be. So now we are at the phase, the final seasoning phase. So there's a couple of seasonings we're going to adjust at this stage. Um, we're going to go ahead and add our garam masala. So it's one teaspoon for a regular recipe and two teaspoons for a double recipe. Okay. I'll go ahead and give that a stir in. And the heat should still be on at this point. that a nice stir and we'll go ahead and add our fenugreek apparently I need to order more <laughs> starting the spices stir in and then once we stir in these spices let it cook for a minute or two not really that long and then we're going to adjust for salt because at this point we haven't added any salt other than salt we used in the caramelization phase so I can almost guarantee you that unless you used mass loads of salt in the caramelization phase, you will need to do some salting. Hey, Michael, do you know where the broom is? So I definitely need a goodly amount of salt. And because my, my curry is so thick, I'm going to add the salt off heat. If you have a soupier curry, then you can always leave it on heat, but I have a very thick quinoa curry. Now garnishes for matar, sorry, quinoa curry, matar quinoa could include a uh, raw red onion, um, Come down. Come down. raw green peppers, <laughs> uh, also lemon wedges for garnish. Squeeze, squeeze some fresh lemon juice on top. After you've uh, plated it up and it's on your plate, then you can adjust, you can 
add a little lemon juice for some brightness. So remember that potatoes are big salt hogs, and so are peas, actually. And of course, one can also adjust salt personally in one's own curry, but I prefer to have it salted to at least a medium level for flavor enhancement, and then people can add more salt if they really need it. People being, like for instance, my beloved husband, who has a much higher sodium tolerance than I do. Let's just give it a little taste. And I, I forgot to mention, you should, if you're using fresh peas, you should also check that they're tender. Why would I need fresh peas? Why do they need to be tender? Well, when they're when they're cooked, they're tender. Yes. Why peas? Why peas? Why peas? Oh, you said peas, not peas. Okay. Yeah, peas. Peas, fresh peas, they should be tender. <laughs> Definitely, I did not say bees. I don't like tender bees <laughs> in my food. <laughs> Ms. B, I'm gonna have her go down. You're heading towards the other one. No bees in food. Yeah, right. The other one? Okay. Oh no. Oh no. The bee has been dealt with. The bee has been dealt with. Yes. Okay, close to the middle. Excellent. It was like on the box. It was like on the box. That bee's yeah, nice. Is it? Probably. Probably. Oh. Now my shot that was in the background in the recording. Oh well. <laughs> okay. Well, um now. You have the option for those who are watching this later, you have the option of serving this over rice, eating it with naan or paratha or some other Indian bready goodness. Like I said, garnishes can include lemon, uh, lemon wedges for squeezing over top, uh, fresh onion just to put on top also, uh, sometimes fresh raw uh, green chilies <laughs> are also common and popular in India and for people who like their food to have a little extra kick. Um, some people do also put yogurt on top, so that is an option. So put some rice down, put some curry on top, garnish as desired. We haven't finished making our rice yet because my, my stove was occupied by my camera and my pan. So I will now prepare the rice because my children are massive rice hogs. Um, so for those who are watching this recording, thank you all for participating in the class in some manner. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, cook creative, guys, and we'll see you next time.